My name is Court Gosha. If you don't know me, I'm the city arborist, and uh, I'm here to present you some information about uh, Asian longhorn beetle in particular and other invasive insects and plants in general. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, again, thanks for coming. And if you have any questions as we go through, I just shout them out. I'll just soon answer them as, as we're going through. So uh, do you hit the lights back there, Linda? Now we're, uh, we're being invaded, but not by extraterrestrials. We have uh, invasive pests that come from a lot of different areas. But what, uh, what exactly is an alien or an exotic um, organism? Something that is not native here, and we look at in Ohio, is that something that came in after 1750, which is when the settlers came in. Okay, so the plants and animals that were here in 1750 are our natives. Anything that came in after that is an exotic uh, or an alien. So, almost all of our food crops are aliens. A lot of our domestic animals are aliens. They're not bad. So when does an alien organism become a bad organism? It's when it takes over. Now we're going to step back a little bit to something that we already know about emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer showed up in Detroit in 2002, came in from uh, China in some pallets in wood. And uh, now it's in 27 states, two provinces. There's been tens of millions of ash trees have died. It's cost private landowners and government entities hundreds of millions of dollars for removal. And the studies show the eventual cost in the uh, developed areas, that would be municipalities only, over the next 20 years would be 10.7 to $25 billion. So it's a costly thing. That brings us to ALB, Asian Long Horned Beetle, which has been recently discovered in southern Ohio, down around Cincinnati. Uh, however, it's been around a lot longer. It was first discovered in 1996 in New York City. Um, let me flip the next slide. These are some pictures from Claremont County, which is uh, just a little bit east of Cincinnati. Uh, before and after, you can see the major removal of trees. Next slide. Uh, here you see a bunch of red spots out in the woods. Those are all trees slated for removal. Next slide. Here's a pile of some of the victims. Next slide. Here's a lane, country lane, going back to a home. And then after, uh, it's totally lined with trees. Every tree's gone. Next slide. They lost their swing. That's expanded past the... Okay. So we really don't want that to happen up here. ALB was first detected in New York City, 1996, several years before Ash Borer was found. Um, it's been in several locations there. They've actually eradicated it in two locations in New York. Um, ended up, uh, as of last week, uh, the tally, I did a monthly tally of all this, 23,723 were removed. Massachusetts and Worcester, they were detected in August of 2008. They lost over 35,000 trees so far. That's still ongoing. Ohio, our detection was in June of 2011. We've had almost 85,000 trees removed so far. Part of this difference is these uh, first uh, infestations were in urban areas. Claremont County is very rural. It's much like our area, uh, and so it's got a lot of forest and a lot more trees to lose. But it can be stopped because it's been eradicated in some areas. The biology is much different than emerald ash borer, so it's something that can be controlled. New Jersey, they were detected in uh, 2002 and they eradic eradicated in 2013, losing 
about 22,000 trees. Toronto, Canada, detected in 1998, eradicated in 2007, losing 28,000 trees. And then in Illinois, they detected in 1998, eradicated in 2008, and only lost a little over 1,700 trees. And now what's the difference? Early detection. They found it right away. The uh, outbreak in Claremont County, Ohio, they estimate had been going on for six to 10 years before they found it. So that's why you're all here tonight. Why I want you all here tonight is to have eyes out there looking for these insects. We don't want them here, but if we got to have them, I want to know right away, as soon as possible, so that we can take steps and uh, eradicate them without losing too many trees. There's a picture of it, and you see it's not a, it's, it's not a hard bug to spot. It's pretty sizable and pretty distinctive. Black and white spy, uh, spots, black and white stripes on the antenna. We've got a preserved specimen you can look at up here. But it's a, it's a good sized bug. So if you see anything like this, let somebody know. Uh, just a little bit about the, the uh, life history of the uh, beetle so you understand kind of how it works. Uh, the adult beetle lays an egg. <coughs> <clears throat> and it, uh, it uh, chews out a little pit on the uh, bark of the tree and lays the egg in there. Egg will uh, hatch in about 10 days and the larva will immediately bore into the tree. And it goes through some instars inside of the tree. And while it's inside of the tree, it's boring around in the center of the tree. Uh, sometime later it pupates and this is a picture of the pupa in the chamber. And when it reaches maturity, it'll emerge here. Now I've got a piece of wood that you can look at up here that has an emergence hole. It's got holes you can see through there where they board around in the center of the tree. You can imagine what that does to the structural integrity of the tree. One of the signs are branches coming down. Uh, there's also egg laying sites that are marked on this, so you can see what they look like. They're uh, just between nickel and quarter sized in diameter. So, those are some of the things we want to look for. This is an adult feeding on a leaf. When the adults emerge, they feed for a short period of time on small twigs and leaves. They do very little damage. It's the larva that does the damage on the inside of the tree. They have a kind of a, a really long period of emergence. They can show up any time from the end of April until the beginning of October. The peak period is late uh, in late July through August, and that's why we're meeting right now, because this is when they would uh, most likely be out there. This is a picture of the egg laying pit, which the adult female chews into the bark of the tree. She lays one egg in each one of these. And each uh, female can lay up to 90 eggs. Does it like turn that orange color? Depends on the species of the tree that's attacking. It might look a little different in some trees. But it's going to be taking the exterior layer of the bark off so you're going to see some of the lighter color on the inside. And it can be anywhere on the tree, not trunk or limbs? Trunk, or limbs, yeah, any, yeah. It can be anywhere on the tree, from well, the main they, trunk up to you know, two or three inch diameter branches. Will there always be at least a couple right together? I mean, so it's not just one lone spot? They typically will be in groups. Uh, now, though there's more some pictures that will show you what they look like when there's a heavy infestation. Um, because the female is going to chew a spot off, lay an egg, then move a small distance, chew it off, and lay another egg. 
here's a picture of a branch that's pretty heavily infested. You can see all those, those are all egg laying sites on a maple tree and branch. This is the larval stage. This is the stage that does the damage to the tree. That's going to be inside in the xylem layer of the tree, which is the wood, the wood part of the tree. They bore around. They go through a few instars where they mold and go to the next stage, and then they start feeding again. And then they get to the final stage, which they turn, uh, they pupate this material here. It's called a frass. It's a mixture of wood shavings and poop from the larva. And that's in the chambers. And when they push out at the end, it ends up on the ground or on a branch or on the bark below the hole. So that's another sign. That's the size of the exit hole. When the adult comes out of the pupa, chews its way back out of the tree, it's going to leave a hole that size. And one way to test to see if it's just a hole or if it's an ALB hole is the pencil test. It's a little bit bigger than a pencil and you should be able to shove a pencil in deep because they have bored to the hardwood. hardwood. There's frass that's caught on the bark underneath some exit holes. You see something like this on a tree that warrants further inspection. And that's an example of the larval tunnels in a, in a branch. And of course that weakens the branches and a lot of times they'll come down in storms. So if you have storm branches come down you can take a look and see if there's anything like that going on with them. Sometimes you will get sap bleeding out of those exit holes, especially with maples. You can see all these white spots on this tree are sap bleeding out of a hole where a beetle came out. Now we've got quarantines in place down in southern Ohio to try to contain this, uh, which means you can't take any wood material out of these areas, any kind of hardwood. Uh, this is the main area right here. These two smaller areas, they believe both were uh, uh, started by people moving firewood. This is up in a park up here, and uh, this is another uh, camp. There was a camping campground or something in this area, so they are pretty sure that you know the original infestation was right around Bethel, and somebody moved some wood to these two sites and got it started up. So it's just that easy to move it around. The beetle itself can't move very far. The biology of the beetle is that they like to stay on the same tree until it's dead. So they don't move around on their own. They also are a really large insect. And a really large insect, it takes a lot of energy to fly and go very far. So the entomologists think that they can go about 400 yards, which is about their maximum. So the strategy down here in Claremont County has been, when they find a severely infested tree, is to remove host trees in about a half mile radius of that tree. That's a lot of trees, but it's a, it's a pretty aggressive approach, but uh, it's probably the proper one to, to get eradication. There's been a lot of opposition to it down there. Yeah, Flo? Carl, what kind of, once those trees are gone, we can't go right in and replace them with anything, can we? I mean, you, if, if it hit Brian, and I hope it never, never, never does, 
but if we took all the trees down, could we come back in with some other type of tree, or is it? There's a few trees that, uh, that they don't feed on, okay? Uh, there's 12 uh, genuses of trees that ALB feeds on. There's about six of those 12 that are highly preferred. Maple is at the top of the list. Maple, buckeye, elm, uh, ash, if there's any ash left. Yeah. They like ash too. Poplars, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of different types of trees that they will attack. Now there are some that uh, would be possible replacements, but it's gonna really reduce our uh, diversity here because we're gonna be very limited. If we have an ALB outbreak, uh, we'll be limited as to what we will want to replant right away. Yes, sir. Uh, do they show a special, uh, specified interest in a particular species of tree or a special or a individual type? Um, maple is the top of the list. That's their, that, that's their most preferred genus. Uh, and I don't think that they've noted any real difference between the, you know, there's many different types of maples, but uh, they, they seem to like them all equally. Of course, that's, that's big because our, our forest uh, land around town here is, uh, has a high percentage of maples in it. Uh, Tree Commission knows that we surveyed the west end of Bryan last year and we were upwards of 50% maple on our street trees. Uh, so it's, uh, it would be major, just even if it just attacked maple, but it's attacking other species as well. So. What can you put in that would help us? Oaks, <laughs> yeah, and of course we're going to get to something else that likes oaks, so okay. there's... <laughs> Court, the um, Asian longhorn beetle, you said that emerald ash borer came in on pallets. How, what brought the um, Asian longhorn beetle in? We think it came in the same way. With pallets? It came in wooden pallets or crates uh, from Asia. Uh, there are they and they have strengthened the laws about you know fumigation of wood materials and so forth and they do some inspecting but it's just a, a drop in the bucket and uh, so you know that's where it's come it's it's part of globalization and global trade and I'm pretty sure that we have probably sent some things over to them too so so, uh, so it potentially could come in not from spreading from southern Ohio but in on pallets absolutely it could, it could, yeah it could come into one of our industries or... right here in Bryan on a pallet or a crate that wasn't properly fumigated so that's why we need to be vigilant the insect itself like I say can't move very fast on its own it needs human assistance and you know we assist them by moving firewood by moving saw logs by moving, uh, 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 you know, merchandise that is on pallets that's not, you know, properly properly fumigated, and that's how it gets spread around. Once a tree is infested, how long does it take before the tree dies? Trees will usually die in less than five years with a, with a heavy infestation. Depends on how, what the health of the tree was to begin with and what type it was, but it's usually fairly rapid. Do they prefer an older tree, younger tree? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Anything that's probably, I mean, I don't think that they go after saplings too much that I know of because there's not enough room for them to bore around. Right. But, uh, you know, anything probably six inches and up, I think, is fair game. There isn't any chemicals yet. Is there any insecticides to treat? They have found that uh, a lot of the uh, neonicotinoids, that the same ones that have been used on ash borer, are somewhat effective. The problem is kill all the bees. The problem is it's not effective. Oh, totally. Uh, they're only yeah. saying even you know with a good treatment, you might only be 70% effective. And the reason for that is that the, uh, the, in, the uh, insecticide is applied and it comes up in the phloem layer, which is this, this layer right on the inside of the bark, okay? So it will, and it's a systemic, so it goes throughout the tree. So it will kill adult beetles that are feeding on the leaves. It will kill larvae that are in this stage here, but I told you that they immediately bore to the middle of the tree. So unless your timing is impeccable, you're not gonna catch all of them. And once they get into this part of the tree, 
the xylem portion in the middle, there's no chemical there. So you're going to have larvae that are going to pop out the next spring and they're going to go, you know, just repeat the cycle. So insecticide is not a, not a real good option. It's probably a preventative maybe if you're close to eradication to treat perimeter trees or something like that. Um, but it's not going to, it's not the silver bullet. Now when they remove the trees, they really can't be used for anything. They've allowed people within the quarantine zone to burn the trees, uh, the cut trees for firewood. Uh, but other than that, the trees are mostly just chipped. They're chipped and turned into mulch. And they, uh, they chip them to a size of less than an inch. And that ensures that there's no viable larva left in the, in the wood. They're experimenting with heat treating now so that uh, they might be able to heat treat uh, to, I think it's 155 degrees for X period of time, like in a, a lumber kiln, uh, that that would uh, kill the larva that's in there and they might be able to you know, export some saw logs and so forth out of that. But I mean, you're losing a lot of, uh, of timber value as well as just losing the trees. Another picture of the quarantine area, that's 61 square miles. I don't know how many square miles is Williams County. I don't know, but I'd say it's probably about half of Williams County at least. So that gives you an idea of the size of the, of the area that's involved. Like I say, it, it can be eradicated. It's, we learned a lot of lessons from Emerald Ash Borer as far as how it moved around a lot faster than it was supposed to be able to because it was only supposed to be able to move so far per year, uh, but it, it jumped a lot faster and that was because of uh, humans helping it. So that's another piece of the education tonight is to not move firewood around at all. Um, buy it wherever you're going, burn it all up, don't bring any home, um, and don't transport it because the other thing is, we don't know what other kinds of things might have come in. There could be some other bug out there that came in on a pallet that hasn't been identified yet. Yes? In a successful quarantine, like, or not quarantine, uh, where they eradicated it, like Illinois, uh, how did they do that? Just removing these trees like you're They about? removed the infested trees, they removed host trees, and they did extensive surveys, and that's going on uh, in Bethel area right now. They have people climbing in the trees, they have people inspecting in bucket trucks, they have ground inspections. They conducted, I believe, 1.8 million tree inspections in Claremont County, and they're, they're trying to find where the actual edge is. And that's what they've done in, in Illinois and some of the other places. And they, they continue to survey to make sure that they didn't miss anything. But basically, to declare eradication, they need to go three years without finding any egg pits, larva, or adults. So, but as I say, early detection is the key. So, the other thing that you should be aware of is that most of these uh, invasive insects have been found by homeowners, not scientists extension people, arborists, or anything like that. It's normal people that just saw something strange on their tree and got it to somebody. So if you find something strange, let me know, let Flo know out extension, call DNR, there's a website you can report on, uh, multiple ways to, uh, to report that information. And don't worry about it if, it's a, if you don't think it's right. I, the, the uh, day that the article was in the paper a couple weeks ago, we got a call from a guy that said, I found this really strange large bug out on my driveway. And I went out and he, he, he let it go. I don't know, if you get a chance, catch it. <laughs> he let it go, uh, but he described it to me and then, you know, we talked about the circumstances of how it came to be there and everything and it turns out it was not an ALB, but I was more than happy to go out there and make sure that it wasn't. But don't hesitate, because that's how we find things, and that's how we find things early. 
if we find uh, if we find it before it gets well established, we don't want it to go for four to six or ten years before we find it because then we'll be cutting thousands of trees down to stop it. Okay, so I've got information up here for you to take tonight that has all pretty much that whole presentation in it, pictures, uh, and you can just go out and scout. Month of August is a good time to do it uh, and see what we find. We might find something else. If you find something strange that doesn't look right, let somebody know. Now, what can you do? Don't move firewood. How many times have I said that? <laughs> Don't move firewood. We're pretty sure, you know, uh, Emerald Ash Borer started up in the Detroit area, and they figured it would go um, a couple miles a year or something like that on its own. But it jumped all over the place pretty quickly, and it ended up first time close here. It was found over in Hicksville, and the next one was found up by Harrison Lake. And we're pretty sure that Hicksville was lumber that went into the pole factory there where they make handles for tools, and then Harrison Lake was some campers that came down from Michigan. So that's how it moves around. <clears throat> Look at your trees. See if there's something going on with them that doesn't seem right. And if you find something unusual, report it. Let somebody know. Clark, will the homes always be the size that we can put a fence on? Yes. Smaller than it's probably something else. Yeah, and there are many other kinds of borers. There are native borers around here that um, exist and are in. You know, they're in check with the uh, ecology of the area. That's the problem with these Asian pests that come in. There is no check to keep them under control. In Asia, where they developed, the trees themselves over tens of thousands of years have developed genetically. The resistant ones, the, only the strong survive, right? So they've developed a genetic strength against them. They may produce more sap or something like that so that the eggs can't uh, set when they hatch properly. Um, the trees are selected out so that the, the tough ones are around. And there's other things that keep those insects in check. Predators, uh, they're in pre uh, predatory insects, uh, diseases, and so forth. Uh, and when they come into a situation like this, they have none of those. And so our trees are helpless to them. Now, uh, ALB is not the only problem that we have. We, uh, gypsy moth has been around for a long time. It's been around since 1869. Uh, started up in New England. And uh, we actually are under quarantine in this county. A lot of you, probably nobody knows that. Uh, we had an outbreak here back in... Uh, it's probably been 10, 12 years ago, yeah. something like that, 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. Uh, on the east side of Bryan, uh, we were lucky. We were, uh, I think they sprayed one time. The next year, they were geared up to spray big time, but we had a real wet year, and the gypsy moth developed a kind of uh, fungal disease, and it kind of wiped them out. We really haven't seen anything around here yet. Some of you have probably seen those little green birdhouse looking things hanging on trees. Those are gypsy moth traps. And uh, uh, they trap every year to, to see where they are. And, uh, but it's something that we gotta be uh, aware of and uh, it could come back around. Uh, similar life cycle, uh, eggs hatch out to a caterpillar. The caterpillar is the thing that does the damage. Oaks are their favorite. I said there was problems with oaks. Oaks are their favorite. They're uh, uh, with a high population. They can defoliate a tree in a few weeks. A tree is defoliated two or three years, it dies. Um, they feed for about two months early in the summer. Form a pupa, uh, which hatches out to an adult. The cycle continues. This will tell you how it's moved. 1968, the red, uh, red area is where Gypsy moth was established. Forty years later, it's moved that far. And there continues to be a line. Whoops, that was the wrong button. If it 
runs right through here, which is the active line where they're expanding south to the southwest. Um, Ohio is active in treating. The recruitment's done in Van Wert County this year and in uh, Hancock County, Fenway area. Um, so they're trying to, trying to slow the spread and suppress it. They use biological uh, pesticides that they spray from airplanes that uh, disrupt the mating cycle. So, like I say, we've been lucky because we've not had anything in our area, but I'm not going to say that it's going to be too much longer before we might see something. So, another thing to watch out for. <coughs> this is what the caterpillars look like, kind of hairy. Uh, when, when there's a big infestation, there's just huge numbers. The numbers are just astronomical. They strip a tree really quickly. This is the part where you can help. These are gypsy moth egg <coughs> masses. This is what we're quarantined for. If you move from Williams County to uh, a county that is non-quarantined, like uh, in central Ohio, where they don't have gypsy moth, you have a checkoff form that you're supposed to fill out that you inspect all of your lawn furniture, lawn mowers, anything that was stored outdoors, picnic tables, that sort of thing because gypsy moths lay their eggs on trees, logs, and anything else that's outside, sometimes on cars. Uh, and that's how they get transported around. So that's what it looks like. And uh, we look for those in the late summer. Now, one more. This is a new one. This is a... Uh, it's called a thousand cancers disease, which attacks black walnut, which we have lots of black walnut around here. It's one of the highest value trees that we have. Um, it's actually a combination thing. There's an uh, insect called a walnut twig beetle, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, less than two millimeters long. And you can see the kind of boring holes that it makes. Here, this is a penny. It's teeny tiny, but it carries a fungus on it. it carries a fungus on it, and the uh, populations just get in huge numbers. Uh, they surveyed a, a five-foot log of walnut at over 28,000 beetles on it. And the problem with this one is that walnut is such a high-value lumber, and so in demand by woodworkers, it's moved around a lot it's for woodworking purposes, and it's moved around from lots of different areas of the country, eBay, Craigslist, and so forth, kind of outside of the regulated stream of things. So uh, it's been found in Ohio. Does it fly? It does. <clears throat> it started out west. Now it started, and it's kind of an alien invader because uh, the beetle itself is mostly native to Mexico. It's also found in southern New Mexico and Arizona. And down there, it feeds on a tree called Arizona walnut. We don't have that here. But the Arizona walnut tree seems to be able to tolerate it just fine. The beetles just uh, uh, feed on the tips of the branches, the small tips, and uh, they drop off and the tree's fine. What's happened is uh, that uh, black walnut, eastern black walnut, has been planted extensively in the west, Colorado, northern New Mexico, uh, up into the northwest, all over the place. And they figured out that they really liked eastern black walnut, and they jumped to a different species. And when they got onto eastern black walnut, instead of attacking small twigs, they attacked the whole tree. So they are uh, boring in on small branches, large branches, main trunk, and 28,000 of them in five feet. And they, that makes a little disease site at each one of those borings. And that's why they call it thousand cankers. Eventually the cankers all join together and it kills the tree. And that's been located in Butler County, uh, southwestern Ohio. Again, down towards Cincinnati here. It's also in uh, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Indiana, maybe Michigan. But 
another one to look out for. And that's the end of the show. Any more questions? I had, we had a wet spring here a couple years ago, real, yeah. real wet spring, late spring. And about that high up on the bottom of my trees in my yard, there were them black caterpillar <coughs> gypsum moths mm -hmm. hanging all around it. I mean, everywhere you looked, it was all around every tree. Dead, though. They were dead. They, they were dead. dead. Hanging by their back legs or front legs, I don't know which, but they were hanging. You could go like that and they'd flop around. But they were just dead. Well, so what, what's the deal there? Well, that's the fungus that saved us. So it's still, it's still out there. I see. That was a fungal, and see, that's how things are naturally kept in check, is you have fungal diseases that control some insects. You have uh, uh, predators that, that control some insects. Uh, when you bring something totally foreign in, those checks aren't in place. So I'm glad to hear that the fungus is still out there. That may keep it suppressed for a there while. There were thousands of them around yeah. the trees. Yeah. I mean, so that tells you that there still were egg masses out there that hatched out, yeah. turned into caterpillars. So um, yeah, got to be watching all the time. Didn't, I haven't had no problems in the last year or two mm -hmm. with uh, leaf, leaf foliage or anything. I can't hear them chewing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, they make a lot of noise when there's a bunch yeah. of them up in the tree. Huh. Court, yes. Had a gentleman bring in um, a bug that's very similar to what we're looking for. It's not dark, but it's got that yeah. long. But so he just wanted to. Yeah, well, I'll show you. I, when all you did, it didn't take one of these already to take one because on the back page of this, there's some lookalikes some large beetles that we have in our area that look like might be mistaken for an ALB because there's a lot of quick beetles and two-eyed beetle so that'll, that'll give you some help but if, if you have any question about whether it really is or not find somebody that knows and if you can catch it, put it in the jar or baggie and put it in the freezer. That will preserve it until you can get it to somebody that can get a positive identification. Yes, Dan? Do you want to give us an update on the ash borer in uh, Bryan and Williams County? Okay, the ash borer uh, in uh, Bryan and Williams County is uh, still active. There uh, still are some ash trees out there. Uh, the vast majority has been removed. Um, but ash borer is going to be with us for a long time. Um, ash borer management for areas further to the south and the west where it's just getting established, uh, are trying to suppress ash borer with uh, you know, insecticide treatments and um, they're doing more trapping to see how the populations move and so forth. But ash borer will probably be with us for a long time because there's a big seed bank in the woods around here. So ash trees are gonna to continue to come up and as soon as uh, even, I found uh, a borer and a sapling on my, in my woods, it was only a little over an inch around, that ash borer in it. So there's still food for them, so they're still gonna be around. There are about 30 trees in Bryan uh, along the streets that I'm tracking that have survived. And some of them are in pretty good shape. I'm not sure why, they all seem to be uh, cultivar of white ash. So they have, must have some more genetic resistance to it. Um, and they are trying to uh, develop um, new varieties that are going to have that genetic resistance so that someday we might be able to plant ash trees again. You know, we didn't think we would ever be able to plant elm trees around here after we had Dutch elm disease. But they, you know, over a lot of years, have developed about 15 different types of elms now that um, resist the Dutch uh, elm disease and people quite well around here. We're starting to plant them again. So hopefully the same thing will happen with ash. But it's a long process. We've got some uh, flowering crab apple trees down mm -hmm. the road here at New Era that are dropping their leaves. What would be causing that? It's probably apple scab. Yeah. Apple scab. We had kind of a wet spring, and that gets it started. And 
I just just treat that. brings early defoliation. You have to, you actually have to treat it, uh, you know, in the springtime. So you have to be kind of uh, looking way ahead. But you can treat it with uh, Dacanil or other types of fungicides. They lose their leaves now when they come back next yeah, year. Yeah, it's pretty common. So one year will be bad that way, and they'll defoliate early. The next year they'll have a better year, and they, they seem to be able to tolerate it fairly well. It just looks yeah. kind of bad when the leaves are all falling down in July. We have quite a few in the park like that this year too. Court, is there anything trouble in hickory trees? Not that I'm aware of, but you're about the third person that's asked me, so I'm thinking I need to investigate that. I haven't yeah. heard anything specifically. Yeah, in the woods yeah. I, uh, one of my coworkers is losing hickories in his woods too, and I need to do some. Have you heard anything, Flo, about that? I didn't quite catch it. Hick hickories, hickories, sudden hickories. death, and hick large hickories large in the woods. Large hickories in the woods. I mm. haven't died. Okay, I, I haven't heard anything on hickories. I'll, I'll one thing I've noticed is the oak trees. It must be a uh, leaf that something is causing the leaves to curl. There's a lot of aphids out there right now. Is that part aphids, of it? aphids make leaves curl up. Uh, that goes hand in hand with a, a low rainfall summer, because when you have a, a regular heavy rains, it tends to wash the young ones off. When you go for two or three weeks without very much rain, populations build up really fast, and the leaves get curly, and then you get the sticky stuff falling out of the trees and all that. Other questions? Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I've got, oh, I did want to mention also, we've got some invasive plants also. We, uh, uh, not just insects, we're not going to talk uh, bugs entirely, but there are some samples up here of invasive plants, exotics that have been escaped their uh, normal use. A lot of these plants were brought in for landscape purposes, or for use in herb gardens or whatnot, and they've escaped and are starting to take over in some of our natural areas. And so there's some samples and some information up here about those. If you have some of those growing in your yard, you might want to get them. We have some On behalf of the um, Brian Tree Commission, I just really would like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to publicly thank Ford for putting this presentation together.